Turn on the television, and you'll be flooded with answers about tomorrow's electricity. Smart grids and wind turbines, traditional sources and new solutions, solar panels on rooftops and electric vehicles on the highway. But powering America for the next century doesn't start with the answers. It starts with asking the right questions. Who should decide our energy future? Congress? State lawmakers? The EPA? Are those people paying attention to the facts? Are they considering all of our options? All of the consequences? No matter what you believe about tomorrow's energy, one thing is clear. We can't have the future we deserve if those who pay for electricity, the families and businesses of America, remain unplugged. Well, the people on the ground ultimately pay the bill. You know, their power may be provided by, a, a, you know, a retail company. Uh, there may be a generating company like in Texas that generates the power. But the ones who ultimately pay the bill are the consumers, whether it be large companies or my small business or my individuals. It's very important that people are allowed to use the resources they have, the natural resources they have, whether it be in middle America or middle Romania or middle Africa, because this is what people in cities did and people in, in the most industrialized countries in the world. People in the richest countries in the world used their natural resources to get rich. You're talking about a third of the people here in this country, 100 million, or poor people. My name is Clarence Lee. My name is Carling Lee. And uh, we've been living in this house about 43 years. We had a a small retirement, which it wasn't much, you know, that I received money. This is our fellowship hall. I have to take care of this, this part here also. She gets a, a little uh, social security. So, and that's what we live off of. It's don't go for you know. So sometimes you have enough and sometimes you don't. You know, you don't really have to look very hard to recognize that consumers in America are hurting. And most people, when it comes to their electricity bills, they don't really have much of a voice. You know, month to month, uh, they go to the mailbox, they pick up the power bill, and they pay it. Now, I had one for about 300 You know, uh, well, it, it takes some of the, you know, you can't buy as much groceries. You have to, you know, <laughs> pay that bill and then cut your grocery bill down. And so that's kind of hard too. I think the, 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 the key point about natural resources is that they are the basis of our wealth. I mean, it's, it's kind of obvious, but poverty is lack of wealth. And lack of wealth is from not either not having the resources to begin with or not utilizing them properly. And you have the United States now has the largest reserves of fossil fuels in the world, including gas, oil, and coal. Russia is number two, and you know Saudi Arabia is number four. The United States is number one, and yet is not self-sufficient. If you genuinely want to make poverty history, you know the slogan, make, let's make poverty history, then you must allow people to use their natural resources, to use their coal and their oil. I spent uh, time in the 70s um, basically doing calculations on what the future of the world might be like um, as uh, various countries develop their energy and what the future could be and, and how you could reduce uh, emissions of carbon dioxide and that sort of thing. If you look at uh, energy resources. There are some big sources of energy like coal and nuclear, uh, and then there are some much smaller sources of uh, fossil energy, which are oil and natural gas. Well, each kind of resource is sort of a trade-off analysis that takes place when you're beginning to try and decide how they fit into your portfolio. So, for example, a coal-fired power plant is fairly expensive to build. It takes a long time to get it online, eight to ten years. Uh, it's a fairly complex 
power plant. But the operating costs of that plant are relatively low, at least today, and then historically it has been. The price of coal has been pretty low. So those plants have very good operating costs, but they have high capital costs. So that's kind of a tension that you have to keep in mind with that plant. Most people believe that it's a power greater than they are. We've been blessed by having 200 years of coal. So all those environmentalists from New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles who are telling now the poor of the world, you can't use your natural resources. The reason they have their computers, the reason they have their cities and their hospitals and their universities is because they exploited their natural resources. So this idea of sustainable development, it's really telling the poorest people on the planet, you can't do what we did. What we should be doing is finding a way to make it cleaner. And we're doing that. If you look at 20 years ago, we're producing 50% more electricity with two-thirds of the emissions. So this is something that we know how to do. We believe that, that coal now with 21st century technology can continue to be a fuel of choice and be clean. So we're starting to see a shift in policy and a shift in understanding that if we're going to drive down the cost of energy, if we're going to make it more uh, plentiful, the supply more plentiful for, for growing our economy, then we're gonna have to look to our own domestic resources here. And I mean, there's simply no question of the fact that we have to take food, energy, and materials from the environment every day in order to live like every other organism does that is alive. And the real challenge is figuring out how to do that with less negative impacts on the environment that we're taking the stuff from. And that is a, an interesting challenge. That's the kind of thing we should be working on every day instead of basically bemoaning the fact that we even exist on this planet in the first place. Today, nuclear power generates about a quarter of our nation's electricity, with zero carbon emissions. In the wake of the Japanese nuclear incident, some nations are shutting down nuclear capacity. A number of environmental groups are calling for the U.S. to do the same. Baseload resources are those kinds of resources that run pretty much uh, at full output all the time. Um, the idea is to put those resources on and leave them running because they operate their best when they're operated at full load. Typically, nuclear, coal are two good examples of baseload resources that are designed to run all the time, and they serve that amount of our customer demand that exists all the time. At the point when I was a student in the 60s, uh, nuclear energy was sort of the wave of the future and it was a very uh, exciting thing. There was, you know, possibilities that uh, it would be too cheap to, to measure and uh, it would be the savior of the world. Well, it's, it's really unfortunate. Like, we got a lot of things right in the early years of the environmental movement, stop the bomb and save the whales and toxic waste. But we made one really serious mistake, and that was we lumped nuclear energy in with nuclear weapons, as if everything nuclear and radioactive was evil. The environmental organization that I'm uh, part of was concerned about having me as a, their representative uh, because, uh, uh, because I'm not sufficiently anti-nuclear. And also some of the other environmental groups were a little concerned about my position. So um, my organization wrote a letter to TVA saying that I was not an appropriate uh, representative of their group and they appointed somebody else. That's the kind of ideological position, almost like a, a, a political religious belief. That's why I left Greenpeace, because I can't think that way. I, I can't bear to live that way. I feel sorry for them for being like in a straitjacket on their mind. Uh, it, it, is, it is hard to imagine that people could become so rigidified in such illogical positions that have no science whatsoever behind them, no evidence behind them, but it seems to be the case. You know, you talk about future solutions and when you talk to some of these groups, you, you hear them say things like, well, we should have a future with less carbon. And then you say, well, okay, what does that mean? Does that mean nuclear energy? And they say, well, no, nuclear has a lot of problems like waste. You say, well, how do you get to a future uh, that, that has the same level of energy production if you don't have nuclear? By 1975, I think, uh, 
a hundred or so nuclear reactors had been built in the United States. So that there was an enormous growth in nuclear power in that period. We haven't built any significant nuclear since the late 70s. You know, there's one reactor being built in East Georgia, but that's about it. We in America invented the notion of commercial, clean, reliable, affordable nuclear power. We invented that and we've continued to uh, enhance the safety margins of nuclear energy. I was asked in an interview on MSNBC, would I be willing to live near a nuclear plant? I said, you know, perhaps too flippantly, actually I'd be perfectly happy to live in a nuclear power plant. It's one of the safest and most secure places in the country. And when people say there's no solution to the problem of nuclear waste, actually there's no problem. It, it, we don't need a solution because the used nuclear fuel is being stored in 80-ton casks, one of the hard, hardest shelled casks we've ever created in our history. There's no way that the used fuel can get out. It's not like some corrosive liquid roiling around in there trying to eat its way out. It is little solid black pellets that aren't even slightly corrosive, just a little bit warm. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has licensed these casks for 120 years outdoors in the element. If we put a roof over them and control the temperature and humidity, they'd be good for thousands of years there without having to even worry about them. If one somehow corroded, you open it up, take out the used fuel, and put it in a new cask. It's not rocket science. So first off, no one is now being harmed by used nuclear fuel. There is no feasibility that anybody is going to be harmed by it, and it represents hundreds of years of energy sitting there waiting to be tapped. In recent months, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, has taken a more aggressive approach to regulation. The agency is currently considering rules to regulate carbon dioxide, to make coal ash a hazardous waste, and to further restrict the operation of industrial boilers and the generation of electricity. Some believe that EPA, not Congress, is controlling America's energy policy. Is a standard procedure for an economic analysis to ignore the impact on jobs? Well, we didn't do a direct analysis, and again, we sought further. So you did not do a direct economic analysis? No, no, no. We, we did a direct economic analysis of the various potential costs that we've identified, uh, which includes uh, cost of compliance by the utility sector, uh, the cost to the states, uh, as well as various benefits. But not a, not a cost on jobs? Not directly. So, so what you did do a cost on jobs then, indirectly? Well, we just looked at the direct cost from complying with the rule. So you did or you did not do jobs? Not, no. It is frustrating to hear one side of a story but not hear another side. This is not just your average job for one. This is what's provide a living for my family. This is what we uh, live off, which I have two wonderful youngins, I have a wife, this is the job that provides this living for them. People always have an idea of what could be done to change things, but there's also a side effect to it. Some say it may be cleaner. It may be. But are you, the people going to be able to uh, afford it? You know, there are over 600 coal plants in the United States, and, and all of them are threatened to some extent by, a, by the coal ash regulation. I've been at Loman Power Plant for almost 20 years. I maintain the maintenance order system, preventive maintenance. Uh, we make sure our fans and our motors run vibration free. I feel the job here is very important. Uh, it, it's important to our community. I mean, you can't just go out to any store and buy the electricity. You get, we make it here at this plant. You know, coal ash regulation is really a totally different animal than things like clean air standards or, or increased technology for boilers. Coal ash is very dangerous because potentially it could make the burning of coal for electricity impossible. It is a fear that I, our regulatory uh, compliance folks and our environmental folks are looking at very carefully that if that is determined to be a hazardous waste, now your, your options for storage are dramatically reduced. We simply uh, will see a dramatic increase in the price of electricity if there are uh, overly stringent regulations on fly ash. You know, I don't think there's anybody in this country that would say that we don't want clean air or clean water. That just makes sense. But when you have a bureaucracy 
that is, is creating regulation after regulation without any thought to how it's going to impact the economy or how it's going to impact jobs, then something is wrong with the way we're doing business in this country. The Environmental Protection Agency has, has issued regulation after regulation in the last several years. And this is not a uh, partisan issue. There has to be a check on the regulatory burden that comes out of, of the United States government. The EPA is the worst offender. The EPA rulemaking process has evolved over time. I'm sure at the beginning EPA set its own internal agendas and said we want to start tackling air and then we want to start attacking certain pollutants within certain provisions of the air law and it would prioritize things. More and more what we're finding, particularly in the last couple of years, particularly in the last couple of months, is that EPA's regulatory agenda is being driven not from internal influences but from external influences, groups that are unhappy with the pace of EPA and going to EPA suing them and saying we're going to force the court to get you to regulate things such as greenhouse gases from certain sectors. Well first what the EPA is doing is it's taking the Clean Air Act, which is an act that was created to protect people from um, health hazards that are uh, from pollutants that are directly emitted into the air that affect them directly. What the EPA is trying to do is use the Clean Air Act to regulate the atmospheric conditions that they believe lead to global warming, which is something that they say doesn't affect us till 2050 anyway. Uh, I'm not saying that global warming isn't an issue or isn't a concern. What I'm saying is, is they're taking an act, a, a federal act, that was created to do one thing, and they are stretching it to do something it was not meant to do. It's really not a democratic process. You know, we should legislate these types of rules in Congress where people can have a voice. But you have to wonder sometimes kind of what is EPA's agenda? You know, you have all of these regulations that are stacking on top of one another from Boiler Mac to Utility Mac, coal ash regulation, ozone standards, greenhouse gases. All of these things are going to create a economic train wreck for America. Look, it's America. If people want to protest something, they're welcome to do that. But we need to move forward with things that will create jobs in this country, particularly in our state of Mississippi. And uh, you would think that groups would look at the fact that we, uh, we do have a soft economy, we have people that are out of work. We think that the EPA should take a more collaborative approach in working with decision makers to say, let's ensure that we have cleaner air and water in the future, but let's do so in a way that Americans still have affordable electricity and an economy that grows jobs. They say diplomacy is the art of saying nice doggy while holding a big stick. You know, I'm, I'm at that stage right now. I'm trying to tell the federal government and the EPA that, listen, the states want to work with you. We want to work with you to protect folks and to look at the environmental impact. We're willing to look at the environmental impact. We're just asking you to look at the economic impact. Just the other day, an official with the EPA admitted they don't even consider jobs uh, in their economic analysis when implementing EPA regulations. They don't consider jobs. As the EPA tries to regulate carbon dioxide, Congress has made it very clear that they have no intention of having carbon dioxide regulated. So what we're seeing with, for instance, the Boiler Mac uh, rule, or we're seeing with um, uh, Utility Mac, or we're seeing with uh, the proposed regulations on carbon dioxide, is that we have an unelected agency or an unelected bureaucracy that is deciding what the rules, the regulations, and the laws of the United States need to be that's not the way the system is supposed to work. One of the most unfortunate things about today's environmental movement is they tend to discount people. They, 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 they basically behave as though human beings are some kind of plague or cancer on the earth and that nature would be better off without us. And it's so ironic because the central teaching of ecology is that we're all part of nature, that human beings came from nature. We're not just in the environment, we are part of the environment. But now is the time where we're saying enough is enough. Sure, it's good to have a purpose inside that's purpose you can in terms of regulation and trying to bring about a more healthier and cleaner environment. But what about the cost? If it's not affordable, then it's not doable. We need smart energy policy that will also protect the environment. And the good news is we can do that. We can have affordable, reliable, clean energy in this country a cleaner environment, cleaner air and water, smart land use, and we can have an economy that grows, producing new jobs. But America is about using our natural resources to make things, to keep electricity rates low, 
you know, when it comes to electricity, we don't have an energy crisis in this country. We have a political crisis. We do use more energy than anywhere else in the world. Uh, but the energy crisis is we really don't produce as much as we should. Uh, I come from an oil and gas state, but we're also a huge growing wind power state and hopefully even solar. Um, we need to produce all the energy we can domestically because that means we control our own destiny. The cleanest parts of the world are the richest parts of the world. The dirtiest parts of the world are the poorest parts of the world. Environmental uh, poverty kills the environment. Poverty destroys the environment. Wealth protects the environment uh, and you get wealth through exploiting your natural resources.